I have nine o'clock on the dot, so we should probably get started bright and early on our last day of Mises University. Um, look forward, yes, I know. You wish it could just go on and on forever, but through the beauty of the internet, <laughs> you can, when you get, as soon as you get home, you can watch all the videos or listen to the audios of all the talks you didn't go to. <laughs> And then it's like it will go on forever and ever. Actually, there, as I'm sure you guys know, if you go to the, uh, the media section of Mises.org, you can find literally hundreds of recordings, video and audio of these kinds of talks, not only from Mises universities in years past, but also a number of special conferences, supporter summits, uh, Mises circles. I mean, I don't, I haven't counted, but there must be, you know, close to a hundred thousand hours of media on there, so you could fill, you know, a uh, hundred iPods and 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 still not have uh, listened to all of them. So, so it really does. <laughs> it really is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, I look forward to seeing some of you uh, later this afternoon for the oral exam. Um, my encouragement, my advice to you is to be uh, is to relax, uh, take it easy. Uh, and if you're in the room that I'm in, slip a $20 bill uh, on your sheet when you hand it in with your courses on it. Um, but uh, don't forget, we have the barbecue tonight as sort of the grand finale uh, for the whole shooting match. And uh, if you guys have not, I, I hope that you've all registered already for the Mises Academy, uh, the, the Mises University course on the Mises Academy site, uh, because among other things, there's the discussion forums which is a chance for you to keep conversations going with people you've met uh, as long as you like. And, you know, I mentioned uh, uh, in the opening, the first lecture that I gave on Monday, uh, how I, that I had first attended the Mises University Summer Conference many, many years ago, back in 1988. And I mentioned how thrilling it was to meet a lot of the eminent speakers uh, and to talk to them and to find out that they were actually fairly normal people, with a few exceptions. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I should have also mentioned that uh, probably the most valuable thing was the relationships that I made with other students, many of whom I'm still in touch with today, you know, 22 years later. Um, so some of the people that you've met this week, um, you know, these, are, these could be life-changing relationships for you. Um, so do, one easy way to keep in touch is through the forums on the Mises Academy site and uh, the regular discussion forums, uh, the Mises community that's hosted by Mises.org. So please participate in those as much as you can. Um, speaking of Mises.org and uh, discussion forums and so on, our topic this morning is networks, information, and technology. And what I want to do is, you know, again, we're towards the end of the week. We're talking about applications and illustrations. So I'm not going to develop any fundamentally new economic theory but rather talk about applications of some Austrian economics principles and mainstream economics principles to some issues that are specific to the technology sector. And one of the reasons that this is particularly important is because in the last, uh, particularly in the last decade, maybe in the last two decades, you know, with the, with the emergence of the commercial internet, the, t the information and telecommunications revolution, in the economy, a lot of people have begun to think about economics in kind of new and different ways, but not always to the good. Okay, many commentators and observers have thought, well, because so much of our production nowadays takes place electronically, you know, electronic money, uh, people are buying and selling information rather than tangible goods and services, maybe kind of the, the old economics doesn't apply anymore. That traditional economics, it is argued, you know, was developed for the old brick-and-mortar world of physical goods and services and, and labor moving around and people, you know, having to transport things to and fro. Now we do it all virtually. We do so much online. You know, transportation costs aren't really important. You know, information is free. Have you ever heard that? You know, information yearns to be free, so why do we need prices? And a, a lot of, essentially there's been a lot of challenge to conventional ways of thinking, conventional economic models. And what I want to, I want to walk through some of those arguments today and kind of bring out their pros and cons and hopefully convince you by the end of the talk that contrary to these kind of hyperbolic pronouncements, 
you know, while there are many new and interesting and important features of the information age, the networked economy, the new economy, nonetheless, the basic principles that we've been studying this week, going back to Carl Menger in 1871, the scholastics even before and so on, still apply. Right? That the, the economic, uh, theories, the economic truths that we've been talking about this week are not just historically contingent and they applied in some prior age, but they don't apply anymore. No, they apply today, uh, just as much as they ever did. Um, in, in the last 10 years or so, maybe 15 years, uh, people started using this term new economy. Have you heard that term before? Uh, particularly in the 90s, right? What was going on in the 90s in the tech sector? Huge software and, t- and hardware bubble, right? The technology bubble of the 1990s. All the software companies, tech startups, huge IPOs, growth of Silicon Valley. So people said, hey, since we have all this new technology, maybe we have a new economy. Okay, what, what did they mean by new economy? Well, we can think about it in a few different ways. One was to emphasize, one common way that people thought about this is to emphasize networks. They said, well, when we say new economy, what we really mean is a networked economy. It's all about networks and links and, and uh, connections, okay? Well, I mean, it's obviously true, right, that in many important ways, uh, network, new technology facilitated networking, right? I mean, the Internet, the most obvious example, right? You can think about uh, social media, um, you know, the importance of being connected to other people, the, the, the decreasing cost of developing thick kind of network relationships. I mean, even going back a hundred years or so to the emergence of the telegraph and the telephone and, you know, then the first email and onto Facebook and so on, right? Clearly people are, people are better networked than they were in, uh, in, 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 you know, eras past in terms of your ability to reach a large number of people who may be very geographically dispersed. Okay. Um, others argued that, uh, while in the old economy, uh, the secret to success for a firm was possessing tangible assets, land, machines, factories, petroleum, and so on, the key to success now is possessing intangible assets like knowledge, information, right? I mean, think about a company like Google, right? I mean, Google does have physical assets. It has servers. It has buildings with workers in it. But no one would argue that Google's competitive advantage comes from the server farms that it owns. Those are commodities. Anybody can have a server farm, right? Google's competitive advantage comes from its, you know, its page rank algorithm and the knowledge that's embodied in the people who work for Google, right? So knowledge, information, or more generally intangibles, it is argued, is the source of advantage today. Whereas physical things were the source of advantage in the past. That, it is claimed, is a fundamental distinction. Kind of related to that is an idea that the manufacturing sector is less important than it was and the services sector is more important than it was. <laughs> Particularly in, you know, advanced mature economies like the US and the EU, you know, as a lot of manufacturing moves offshore and so on, they say that, well, maybe in the, in the 19th century, the U.S. had a comparative advantage in producing steel. Now the, you know, now China or India has that comparative advantage. We're not good at making stuff in the U.S., but we are good at providing services. Like, you know, we have more lawyers per capita than any other country, so we're really good at suing each other. Um, uh, people have also observed uh, the rise of kind of new kinds of organizations Right? More diffusely structured, if you like, networked organizations. Right? So people say, well, in the old economy, you know, big hierarchical companies like General Motors or uh, IBM, you know, with bosses and layers of hierarchy and so on were the dominant sort of organization on the landscape. But now it's lean and mean companies that are, that are smaller, that are flatter. Have you heard that term? You know, flatter hierarchies. Fewer layers between people at the bottom and people at the top because the people at the bottom are not just assembly line workers who physically stick stuff together. They're knowledge workers. 
And their knowledge is just as important for company success as the CEO's knowledge. Therefore, organizations are flatter. They're more diffused. Uh, you know, to start a company now, all you have to have is a website and you can outsource the manufacturing to China and you can outsource the delivery to UPS and you only need one employee and, you know, and a one PC and you can have a, you know, multi-million dollar company. <laughs> now, I mean, again, it's true that, uh, if we look at the landscape empirically, um, there's reason to take those trends seriously. We do see some new kinds of organizational forms. Though, just as a, as an aside, I think the the magnitude has been magnitude has been exaggerated. There's very little evidence that all companies are becoming flatter, or that you know, on average, companies are flatter and more diffused and less centralized, and so on. That's the evidence. The evidence is not very clear on that point. But you know, looking at these kinds of things, one could make a reasonable case that something is different. Something is different. Now, because of this. Does that mean that the old rules no longer apply? So is regular economics or regular Austrian economics still useful? And here I'm not making nuanced and subtle distinctions between Mises, Hayek, Kirzner, Rothbard, whatever. I just mean sort of plain standard economic theory that all of us would agree on readily. Is that still useful? Well, uh, in the last uh, few years, several books have come out uh, arguing, ar- arguing over this point, right? Uh, uh, one issue that has come up is, uh, has to do with, uh, markets and exchange and information. So people have, uh, written about online markets, you know, eBay and then online markets for, uh, business to business commerce and so on and asked if online markets are different from traditional markets. <coughs> people have also studied, uh, the idea of information as a good that you buy and sell. Rather than buying and selling widgets or buying and selling bread, you're buying and selling information. Does that make the market different somehow? Uh, a couple of books that uh, discuss these issues, one that's quite good and one that is not good, <laughs> include uh, Information Rules by Carl Shapiro and Hal Varian, which I think is a very good book. There are two mainstream neoclassical economists who have thought a lot about uh, information goods, markets for information, on, uh, pricing of online goods, and so on. Uh, the, the book is a little bit dated. I think it was published in um, the mid 1990s. No, sorry, I think it's 98 or 99, maybe. Uh, but but the basic basic arguments are very very good. A book that came out around the same time that I think is not so good by the journalist Kevin Kelly. It's called New Rules for the New Economy. And, you know, with a title like that, you can already be a little bit suspicious, right? This is one of these books that says, you know, the old rules don't apply, regular economics isn't useful, and so on. It's a lot of exaggeration, and it's, I mean, it's a little bit unfair to authors like Kevin Kelly to point out that, okay, this book was written just before the bust, okay, of the tech sector. So there are a lot of very breathy, excited pronouncements about how this tech boom will go on forever. You know, anytime somebody writes that, that's a signal that, you know, within six months it's all going to crash. And, of course, it did. Um, some other issues that were discussed include um, what are called network effects. And we'll talk about those in some more detail in just a moment. Uh, network effects refer to cases where the value of being in a network depends on how big the network is, right? So, you know, the value of being on Facebook depends on how many other people are already on Facebook, okay? You don't want to be in some social network program or have some kind of chat client or whatever that only three other people have, and then it's not useful to you, right? And that leads to some kind of weird phenomena that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, there's also what um, uh, people call sort of peer, peer production, or what the uh, legal scholar, uh, a guy named Benkler, you can't really see on the slide, it, his name is uh, uh, Yokai Benkler, B-E-N-K-L-E-R. He wrote a book called The Wealth of Networks that I think is a very smart book. Uh, I wrote a review of it in the Independent Review where I raised some criticisms. He's kind of a socially, you know, sort of left liberal kind of academic who... Uh, thinks that uh, net, the network economy is a good thing because it will break down traditional hierarchies and, uh, you know, sort of the bosses are bad and, and we should empower the workers and that kind of stuff. 
Um, but it has a lot of interesting ideas in it. Uh, another book that talks about the same kind of stuff in a very shallow way is called Wikinomics by uh, two professors, Tapscott and Williams. So basically their argument is that you kind of need a new economics for the wiki world, the wikified world. What do they mean by wikified world? Well, think about Wikipedia, right? Compare Wikipedia to the Encyclopedia Britannica. The Encyclopedia Britannica is written top down, right? The publishers hire experts who write authoritative chapters on different subjects. It's all edited and cleared and reviewed and so on. Compare, you guys all know how Wikipedia works, right? Anybody can write or edit an entry in Wikipedia. Uh, how do you think somebody like me got an entry in Wikipedia? Um, you know, and then it's, it's kind of a bottom up, spontaneous, decentralized kind of process. By the way, you can see how people who have, uh, who, who think about markets and, uh, particularly, uh, people influenced by Hayek's notion of spontaneous order have been very attracted to Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is like the spontaneous order encyclopedia and the Britannica is like central planning or something like that, right? Uh, so Tapscott and Williams argue that the whole world is wikified in some way and you need new economics. I'm not very sympathetic to their claim, uh, to, to their book and it has a lot of exaggerated claims in it. What Benkler calls commons-based peer production is, again, like Wikipedia, uh, you know, it's kind of peer-to-peer. In other words, all of us can contribute to creating the product. And the end result was not produced by a few experts, but was produced by all of us. And the output of it, the product itself is not owned by anybody. It's in the commons, as they, as, 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 as legal scholars would say. So the output of Wikipedia is not privately owned by some for-profit company. It's in the commons, meaning it's owned by all of us or owned by none of us. Okay. If you think I'm exaggerating, here's a quote from the Kevin Kelly book, New Rules for the New Economy. Uh, he says, in this writing in 1998, sorry, the, the best, the very best gets cheaper each year. Uh, that isn't true of Bentley's, by the way, but... Uh, he says, this rule of thumb is so ingrained in our contemporary lifestyle that we bank on it without marveling at it. But marvel we should because this paradox is a major engine of the new economy. Though most, uh, th- sorry, through most of the industrial age, consumers experienced slight improvements in quality for slight increases in price. These are my highlights. But the arrival of the microprocessor flipped the price equation. In the information age, customers quickly came to count on drastically superior quality for less price over time. The price and quality curves diverge so dramatically that it sometimes seems seems as if the better something is, the cheaper it will cost. And you think, well, wait a minute, that <coughs> and it's like, well, what is the does that is that like an upward sloping demand curve or you know that you pay less to get a better thing? I mean, if you've if you've studied elementary economics, you can see right away that they're confusing sort of shifts in the demand curve over time or shifts in the cost of production over time with with changes at a moment in time, right? So it, it, today, to get a higher quality product, you actually have to pay more than a lower quality product, even if it's software or a computer or whatever. All they're pointing out is over time, Improvements in, uh, it, you know, our ability to produce these things effectively has increased so much that, you know, the price of, you know, memory or whatever has fallen dramatically over time as we've gotten more efficient, right? But this is hardly new. The same thing happened with transportation in the 19th century with the railroads. Think about the cost of the printing press. Uh, think about the cost of printing with the invention of the printing press. Before Gutenberg, you know, it cost a, you know, a thousand hours of some monk's time to produce one copy of a manuscript. After the printing press, it took, you know, 15 minutes of some unskilled laborer's time. I mean, we understand that. That's not really anything all that extraordinary. It's just, te- it's just rapid technological improvement. Okay. Doesn't mean that the price equation has flipped, whatever that means. Um, uh, a, a report that came from the Dallas Fed around the same time made an even bolder claim that was often associated with this new economy stuff. Scarcity, the first assumption of the old economy, isn't the dominant feature of the new economy. I mean, right away, that causes us some problems, right? (laughs) I mean, we start basic economics on day one by talking about scarcity. If there's no scarcity, 
then there are no opportunity costs, no need for economic actors to trade among alternatives. We, you know, in a world of superabundance, we don't need, I mean, I don't know what economic, economic theory would be. There's no reason to study economics. Um, they say many of today's markets are awash with goods and services. I don't know about that. Sellers compete aggressively for buyers. They discount. They cut costs. They expand markets through relentless promotion and advertising. Okay, fine. Again, this, that isn't something that was invented in 1990, you know, those kind of practices. Increasing returns to scale pervade the new economy. More of today's companies and industries thrive on quantity discounts. The higher the demand, the lower the price, which makes you think, wait a minute. So, uh, decreasing returns to scale dominated the old economy. Uh, so producing more goods and services pushed prices up. But look, if you guys have studied returns to scale, you know that some production processes exhibit decreasing returns to scale, some constant returns to scale, increasing returns to scale. It isn't the case that you know there were no production processes exhibiting increasing returns to scale before the computer was invented, and now everything is increasing returns to scale. I mean, I mean you know, these these kinds of claims take a potentially interesting observation, you know, a little grain of truth, and then wildly exaggerate it into some bold claim about how everything's different, okay? Um, one question to ask is, you know, well, how new is really new, okay? Um, are these new things really unprecedented? And when things have changed, when things are different, you know, what's the magnitude of the effect? Is it a little bit different or is it radically different? So I started thinking about this and made up this little chart, okay, of what's sort of in the new economy and what's in the old economy. So people say, well, the cost of publishing has rapidly fallen. And I mean, that's true, right? I mean, to publish books, to publish articles, you don't need a bunch of big printing presses and a huge publishing company and warehouses and so on. You know, you can just write a web, you can create a web page and you've published, okay? You can... You can blog, you can, you can tweet, you, whatever. And in the old economy, you know, you couldn't do that. Well, that's not really true. Um, if you if, think, think back to say the 18th century, 17th, 18th centuries, around the time of the American Revolution, for example, and this, uh, propagation of kind of radical dissenting information through these cheap little pamphlets or what they called handbills, right? So somebody would, uh, stick a little, you know, a, a piece of paper, uh, you know, on the door of some official building, you know, with, with 32 grievances against the king and that sort of thing. Uh, if you, again, if you've studied the American Revolution, you know there was a huge circulation of these kind of underground letters and documents and cheaply produced pamphlets espousing radical ideas. You know, Tom Paine's Common Sense, for example. Common Sense by Thomas Paine was not, you know, this big book produced in a beautiful leather-bound edition that, you know, was sitting on the coffee tables of the high and mighty around that time. No, I mean, it was an underground pamphlet. It's funny, I was, um, earlier this week, I was looking in one of the archive rooms here at the Mises Institute where they have uh, Murray Rothbard's personal correspondence and papers. And Rothbard was a great collector of, well, of pamphlets. And uh, back in the 60s and 70s, when the libertarian movement was starting to take off, there were all these little publications that circulated around. Some of you may have seen, oh, how many of you have seen Reason Magazine, for example? You know, right now, it, it you know, it's kind of a gloss, it has a glossy cover, and it's slick, and it's fancy, and it looks just like Time or Newsweek or whatever. You know, back in, uh, you know, late 70s, Reason Magazine was like a little cheap mimeographed thing on, you know, it's like typed on a typewriter on plain paper and, it, you know, circulated kind of underground through the mail. It wasn't a respectable magazine. Rothbard has dozens of these in his collection, a bunch of obscure little pamphlets that I'd never even heard of with all kinds of interesting news and gossip. I mean, it was the predecessor to the blog, to the Twitter account, and so on. I mean, you know, is it cheaper to produce those kinds of things now on the web than it was in the old days when you had to actually print something on a piece of paper? Well, sure, of course. Is it easier to circulate them? Totally. But is the idea of kind of underground, mass market, bottom-up, unofficial communication brand new? Of course not. Um, what about the Internet, you say? 
the ability to communicate quickly at low cost with people all around the world. There's a fascinating book, uh, I, I should have a picture of it, but I don't, by a guy named Standage, Thomas Standage, S-T-A-N-D-A-G-E, titled The Victorian Internet. The Victorian Internet. It's a history of the telegraph. You guys know the telegraph? You know, beep, 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 with Morse code and so on. Uh, the electric telegraph was a radical innovation of the 19th century that uh, c- completely revolutionized communications media, right? So prior to the electric telegraph, actually there were, um, there were uh, visual telegraphs with flags and even smoke signals and so on. How many of you have been to San Francisco before? Well, you know that uh, one of the hills in San Francisco that has Coit Tower on it is called Telegraph Hill. You might think, well, that's a weird name for a... Why would you, why would you have to put a telegraph on a hill? Well, if you think of a telegraph as the 19th century thing with wires, it would be odd. But in, uh, prior to that, uh, they had a series of uh, signaling stations with people uh, with flags. And so they would communicate with different patterns on the flags, and somebody at another hill would be looking through a, a, a spyglass, and then they would signal on to the next person and so on. Do you remember that, the, the great scene, I think it's in the second episode of Lord of the Rings, where they have the signal fires on the mountains, you know, tra- traversing vast distances. It's a pretty simple signal, fire on or fire off. In a very sophisticated language. But that, that's the idea of communicating over a distance. For a long time it was done visually, and then uh, uh, when the electric telegraph was invented, it was possible to send a message from uh, North America to Europe in just a few seconds. This was considered by people at the time a, a revolutionary, society-shattering innovation. And it's funny that there were books and articles and so on published in the 19th century that read just like Kevin Kelly's New Rules for the New Economy. They said, oh my gosh, this is completely different. This is unprecedented. Uh, now we can communicate at a distance for free. Now uh, companies will be smaller. Uh, production will be more localized, et cetera, et cetera. Standage even discusses how um, the operators of uh, the telegraph stations, you know, they used Morse code. They were a kind of a specialized group. They developed their own slang. They had their own ch- equivalent of chat rooms. Uh, you know, they used kind of like a texting language today, the equivalent of that back then. They were kind of nerds. They were kind of geeks who didn't get out much and didn't have a suntan and that kind of thing. Just like we think of computer nerds today. I mean, the analogy is, is, I mean, it's, 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 it's really remarkable how it appeared to people at the time. The way that innovation appeared at the time is just the way it, the internet appeared to people, uh, you know, 20 years ago. They'll say, well, but, but what about information goods? Right? I mean, what, Google is really just a collection of information, uh, or, or a, a, an organized directory, you know, that you can browse, the Yahoo phone book or whatever. This is something new. We're not selling stuff, we're selling information. Well, I mean, we had telephone directories. Okay, the phone directory is just like an internet listing of names and numbers. It's just a little bit more cumbersome to search. Um, is the PC a radical innovation? Well, sure it is. On the other hand, we've had plenty of radical innovations before. Um, there's a, uh, a lot of people have done studies of what they call adoption. This is, uh, some people call this an S curve because it looks like a letter S. The rate at which new technologies are typically adopted by individuals, by households, for example. The reason it has this kind of S shape, so you have time on the horizontal axis. And the idea is when, it, when something brand new comes onto the market, at first only a few people get one. Right? There are a few early adopters, the first people to get the latest, you know, the latest kind of phone or the latest computer or the iPad or whatever. But then, you know, as the thing takes off, the adoption rate increases. Lots of people get it. And then after a while, after a few years, you get to the point where almost everybody who wants one has already got one. And the rate of adoption kind of flattens out. Well, if you look at the adoption rates for electricity in the 19th century, the automobile in the early 20th century, refrigerators, washing machines, telephones, VCRs in the middle of the 20th century, the adoption pattern is almost exactly the same as that for PCs. Okay, so this idea of kind of a a wave of momentum where all of a sudden the thing takes off and everybody gets on the bandwagon, that's characteristic of almost all 
consumer-oriented technological innovation. Um, you know, what Benkler calls commons-based peer production, the idea that we can all make a contribution to something in a decentralized fashion, unguided by central intervention and so on. Well, that's just, that's just the market, right? I mean, the market is an example of commons-based peer production. Individuals exchanging goods and services in the absence of central government direction or intervention. So again, we're, we're very familiar with these things, okay? Let me digress for just a moment to talk about information, uh, because a lot of attention has gone into this. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of attention given to the claim that when you buy, when you produce, and when you sell and buy information, you're doing something fundamentally different than when you produce and buy and sell tangible goods and services. Okay? First thing to realize is that when we talk about information goods or information markets, what's being exchanged on the market is not, you know, information in some broad, abstract fashion. No, it's specific, you know, discrete marginal units of information that's being bought and sold. Okay? Um, if, if, if you, uh, have a website, in which you sell, you know, uh, information about travel destinations or something. When people pay you, let's say they have to register for your site and pay a subscription fee to have access to the stuff you have, they're not buying information in some abstract sense. They're buying the specific pieces of information that you deliver to them in exchange for that subscription price. Okay? It's like, you know, you hear people talk about the environment. And they say, well, well, do you value the environment? I don't know. I mean, I guess kind of. What does that mean? Right? I mean, there's no way to answer a question like that. Now, if they say, here is a little plot of undeveloped land with trees and baby seals and things on it, you know, <laughs> and you own it, you know, would you be willing to give it up in exchange for X dollars so they can put a shopping center on it? Well, that's a tangible, right? Now we're talking about a specific discrete unit of the environment that I can price and we can exchange. But we don't trade the environment. We trade land. We trade trees. <laughs> you know, we trade seeds or whatever. It's kind of the same thing with information. We need to keep that in mind, first of all. Second point is that information goods are economic goods, just like any goods. Right? Remember Menger's notion of what it means to be an economic good and how agents evaluate economic goods. Right? I mean, a specific, discrete, exchangeable piece of information is evaluated by consumers according to their subjective valuations on the margin, just like any other good or service. We could go through, uh, we could use Menger's procedure to derive the law of demand for an information good, just like we could any other good, when we'd have the law of diminishing marginal utility would still hold, and so on. Okay. As we already mentioned, information goods are not new. I mean, think of books, okay? Books are information goods. When you buy a book, most books, what your, you know, your willingness to pay is not determined by the thickness of the paper and the quality of the binding exclusively and your ability to use it, you know, as fuel for the fire or to hit somebody on the head. I mean, it could be. But in most cases, what you're buying is the knowledge that you will gain from reading the book. Okay, so books are information goods. Maps are information goods. Paying for a lecture, you're buying information. Uh, you know, hiring a guide, consulting a directory, right? I mean, the notion of people paying money for information or people using scarce goods and services to produce information goes back, you know, as far back as we can trace human history. Okay. Now, it is true, what's true about these new economy claims, the little grain of truth, is that the production process for information tends to have different characteristics from the production process for shoes. Okay. The, for example, the idea of uh, the, the, the initial cost, the initial outlays, the fixed costs, tend to be re very high relative to the variable costs. Okay. So once you have written the book, the cost of producing yet one more copy of it is relatively small. There's printing costs and so on. But the major cost in producing, you know, uh, does anybody have a book? Uh, 
you know, we don't have books anymore. Um, you know, if you're holding a unit of a book in your hand, the major cost of producing that copy that you hold in your hand is the cost of creating the content. Okay, writing the book. Once you've got the book written, you can reproduce it at fairly low cost. Right? Now that has some interesting implications for uh, the way books are priced, the way books are marketed, uh, the rate at which books will be produced, and so on. Right? Uh, so, for example, uh, with the production of information, you also see uh, what's, what's called two-part pricing. Right? So you give away some things and then try to make money selling other things. Like, um, uh, take Adobe Acrobat, for example. Right? So you can get the free Adobe PDF, you can get the PDF reader for free. Right? And some other, some, you know, editions of Word and so on can generate some PDFs and so on. But if you want the full, the full featured Adobe Acrobat product, you have to buy it. Okay? You think, well, why would Adobe be giving away, uh, the PDF reader for free? Aren't you just giving away free stuff? You could be making money. Why not sell the reader? Well, obviously, Adobe's strategy, when it first came up with this new product, was to try to establish PDF as kind of a universal format that everyone would use, right? So they would give away the free version, the basic version, but then charge money for the deluxe version or for the software that produces the highest quality PDFs, okay? So you charge different prices for slightly different versions of the commodity. Um, you also might charge different prices to different kinds of customers, you might charge a low price to students and a higher price to large businesses and so on as a way to try to uh, maximize the receipts that you get from selling this information good. It's also true that in producing and selling information goods, it often helps to move first. You know, there's, there's typically a, first, a significant first mover advantage. Or to put it differently, uh, incumbents often have advantages over entrants. Incumbents often have advantages over entrants in the following sense, right? You know, take an operating system like Windows, okay? If I wanted to create my own operating system, you know, Klein OS, you could sell <laughs> Klein 7 or whatever, uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 there's no legal barrier preventing me from doing so, but, you know, Microsoft has an advantage over me in that they've already written the code, Right? They have already written Windows 7, and the cost to Microsoft of producing yet one more copy of Windows 7 is either basically zero if you download it, or, you know, five cents if they press it onto a DVD and, you know, give you the DVD. Okay? I, I can't charge prices that low, at least not at the beginning, because I've got to be able to recoup at least my initial investment in hiring programmers and write to, all the hours to write the code and so on. Okay, so that simply says that it's difficult for, in many cases, not, not, it's not a praxeological truth, but it's often difficult for new entrants to compete head to head with incumbents in markets for information goods. Because once you have the information, it's easy to get new customers at low cost. Okay, now the flip side of that is that it, new entrants can effectively compete with incumbents in kind of niche markets. Okay, so it, it, this is actually relevant for the antitrust case against Microsoft, which we might mention towards the end, uh, some of the antitrust cases back in the 90s. Um, the fact that Microsoft already has Microsoft Windows does not mean it is impossible for other operating systems to compete with Microsoft. It just isn't a very smart play to try to compete head-to-head, -head, making a full-featured desktop operating system. On the other hand, you can create a product that is more specialized, maybe, such as, you know, the operating system that runs on the iPhone. Okay, I mean, that's an operating system, right? Is the iPhone a substitute for a desktop PC? Well, I mean, they're not identical. It's not a perfect substitute, but you can do many of the same things that you can do on a desktop PC. Uh, you know, I have friends who have bought an iPad, and when they travel, they only take their iPad now. They don't even take a, you know, a regular laptop, a Windows-based laptop, or even a full-fledged Mac uh, laptop because the iPad does enough that they can use it on the road for email and web surfing and creating some documents and so on. So the, the you know uh, the the OS that runs on the iPad it's not exactly the same as the OS that runs uh, it's not the same as Windows Seven, 
But to some degree, it's a substitute, and it's certainly a viable competitor. Okay, So it is possible to compete with incumbents in markets for information goods, but you have to be clever at it. You have to be strategic in how you do it. What about so-called network effects? Network effects. One of the characteristics of the network economy, it is alleged, is that goods and services that are connected in this way, right? Uh, that uh, if you produce and sell networks or networked goods, there are very peculiar features of those markets that lead to inefficiencies or so-called market failure. And the most important of these is what uh, was originally called network externalities, but is more correctly called network effects. It's not necessarily an externality, for reasons I'll explain. Uh, but network effects, as we mentioned before, network effects exist when the value of being on a network depends on the number of other people also on the network. Okay? Um, you know, to use a very retro example for you guys, you know, would you want to be the first person on the planet ever to have a fax machine? You know, what would you do with it? I mean, who would you send a fax to? It, it wouldn't be anything to do with it. Okay, but likewise, you know, being on Twitter or whatever, being on Facebook, MySpace, LinkedIn, whatever, Plaxo, right? I mean, you probably get a lot of invitations from people to be your friend on some network you've never heard of, some social networking tool. And you probably just ignore it until eventually it reaches a point where everybody's talking about that one particular networking tool. You think, well, maybe I better get on it too, okay? Why does that matter? Well, the uh, uh, critics of the market have argued that when network effects are present and there are competing technologies, the market will often choose the less efficient technology. The market doesn't work. The market breaks down. The market fails in the presence of network effects. What do they have in mind? Well, maybe it's easiest to illustrate this with an example, and then I'll generalize from it. Take the QWERTY keyboard. Okay, most of you are familiar with the typical layout of a typewriter keyboard or a PC keyboard, you know, Q-W-E-R-T-Y along the top. There are slight variations from country to country, but the dominant world standard and the standard in the U.S. is what we call the QWERTY standard. You know, if you've ever looked at a, a standard keyboard, you might have wondered, why QWERTY? I mean, it, that seems sort of strange and arbitrary. I mean, why not A, B, C, D, E? Or you, know, you can imagine any sort of particular pattern of letters that could have become the standard. Why do we use this QWERTY standard? Well, realize right away that uh, there are advantages in having a common standard. Right? If every keyboard of every computer or every typewriter or every you know phone with a with a keypad had its own uh, you know, arrangement of letters, then you could never learn to touch type, right? I mean, there, if, if you're producing a computer or a typewriter, it's in your interest to use the same layout that most other people use because they already know how to type on it and so on, okay? But that begs the question of why one particular layout should become the standard as opposed to any number of other layouts you could imagine. Well, the story, the network effects story goes something like this. Suppose that you have five different typewriters with five different keyboard layouts, okay? And there are five typists, each of whom knows how to type on his particular keyboard layout. And then a sixth person comes along and says, you know, I want to, uh, I want to produce a typewriter or I want to make a typewriter to use. It would be in my interest to, to kind of link up with somebody who's already got one. I'd like to be able to share, uh, you know, to be able to type on their exchange keyboards and be compatible and so on. Now, which one will I use? Well, there's five different standards. Assume they're all equally good. They're just different. So maybe I just randomly, I flip a coin or whatever. I just randomly choose one particular keyboard standard. So now there are four people using four standards. There are four standards with one user each. And then a fifth standard that now has two users. Just by pure random, just by pure luck. Now, a seventh person comes along and is trying to decide what keyboard format to use, and he looks and says, well, there's a bunch that only have one user, but here's one that has two users. 
So other things equal, I'm better off choosing that one because now I'm part of a network of three users. We can trade machines and we can, you know, write programs for each other and so on. So the seventh person chooses that same standard that had two users. Now it has three. And then the next person comes along and the next person comes along. You see what happens, right? Eventually the whole industry converges on that one standard, not because it's better than the others, but just because for purely random reasons it happened to have more users than the other ones. Okay, this is a phenomenon of what uh, some mainstream economic historians have called path dependence. Path dependence. Path dependence is simply the idea that history matters in the sense that you know where we are today depends on where we were yesterday. And so they argue that the reason the QWERTY keyboard is standard today is because QWERTY was the standard yesterday. And the reason it was the standard yesterday is because it was the standard the day before that and so on. Namely, once a particular technology gets established as the dominant standard, we're kind of stuck with it, right? We can't really break out of it. We can't switch to some alternative technology, even if the alternative is better, is more efficient, is superior in some way. We kind of, once you start going down one particular path, you're stuck. You cannot break out of that path. Okay, because, you know, to switch from QWERTY to some alternative layout, you know, basically everybody would have to switch at the same time to maintain interoperability. You can't be, you don't want to be the only one who switches. It's like these cases, uh, is anybody here from Scandinavia? It's like uh, uh, Sweden is an interesting case of a country that uh, for many years had the British practice of driving on the left-hand side of the road, and then Sweden switched in late 1960s from driving on the left to driving on the right, the way most of Europe does, and the way we do in North America. But you can imagine that they had to coordinate that very carefully. Okay, you know, At the stroke of midnight, we all agree that we will start driving on the right instead of the left. You couldn't do that kind of incrementally, step by step. You know, after, Over a long period, there would be some coordination problems. And so that's the argument with things like QWERTY. This argument also came up with the old VHS format for video cassette recorders. Some of you old timers may remember the original format war between VHS and Betamax, a version of which we saw again about five years ago with Blu-ray versus HD DVD. How many of you have a Blu-ray? A lot of you guys probably have a Blu-ray player now, but you know, Blu-ray is one of these things with the S curve, right? At first, when eight high definition DVD players came on the market, there, there weren't many customers. Why? Because there were two incompatible formats, Blu-ray and HD DVD. And did any, of you, did any of you buy an HD DVD player that subsequently got stranded once the market converged on Blu-ray? Right? You don't want to buy the one that will end up being the, the loser format. So people kind of wait to see which one will end up the dominant format before they jump in. Okay? But again, the argument is even if Blu-ray is no better than HD DVD, if even for purely random reasons it has a little bit of a bigger installed base, it will become the dominant standard. Okay, uh, in the literature on network effects and path dependence, you you know this claim that we get locked into inferior technologies. You find all kinds of examples, some of them seemingly bizarre, about you know cases where the market chose the wrong technological standard. They say that, uh, you know, well, uh, DC power is really superior to AC power. Some people, Paul, the economic historian Paul David even argued that the steam engine is really superior to the internal combustion engine. And we should be driving cars with steam engines in them, but because of nefarious network externalities, the market ended up getting stuck with the internal combustion engine, and we went down the wrong path, we got locked into it, now we can't get out. Uh, this was a major part of the government's antitrust case against Microsoft in the 1990s. The claim was that Microsoft's platform, MS-DOS, and followed by Microsoft Windows and so on, had become dominant purely because of network effects. In fact, it was argued Microsoft's operating system is far inferior to you know, the Mac OS, for example, or Unix or some other rivals but that Windows became the dominant standard and Microsoft ended up having a huge share of the market for desktop operating systems purely because of these sort of, you know, random events 
very aggressive marketing practices by Bill Gates, potentially, you know, illegal, unethical marketing practices, and path dependence. And now there's nothing we can do. We're stuck with Windows as the dominant platform. We can't switch to something else collectively, even if we wanted to. Okay? Is this... uh, Are network effects a source of market failure? Right? Is, are these kinds of examples, historical examples, evidence that in markets for technology, particularly where, particularly where, the, where there are kind of compatibility or standards issues involved, that we cannot rely on the free market to choose the standard? That is the implication of the critics like Paul David, for example, that, well, the, the government should choose the standard somehow. Because the market cannot be relied upon to choose the most efficient, the most effective standard. Is that argument, you know, is that a reasonable argument? Well, let's break it down uh, into different components. Um, One thing to realize is, you know, we always have imperfect knowledge about the future, right? Entrepreneurs make decisions under conditions of genuine uncertainty. Consumers make adoption decisions under conditions of uncertainty. No one knows exactly what the future will bring. It could very well be the case that we, you know, we look back at some decision we made in the past, either as an individual or as a society, and say, darn it, I wish we hadn't done that. Okay? Darn it, I wish the market hadn't chosen QWERTY. Now that we have all this additional knowledge from, you know, scientific tests of typing speed and ergonomic studies, now we realize that some other layout would have been better. I wish we had chosen that other layout. Well, that is only a policy relevant issue if at the time that people were choosing between QWERTY and something else, they had that knowledge. Right? I mean, there could always be ex post regret. We made a mistake, the market made a mistake. I mean, that's only relevant if some other decision-making process would conceivably have come up with a better solution. Right? We always want to avoid, it's been discussed in several lectures this week, you know, the so-called nirvana fallacy. That if the market does not lead to a solution that some third party thinks is perfect in some way, that therefore we should use the government to do it instead. I mean, maybe the government would have done an even worse job than the market. Okay, so that that alone doesn't really help us, you know, with this policy issue. We also should think about the political process. In other words, suppose that instead of allowing the market to decide what kind of keyboard layout it wanted, we had a blue ribbon commission, you know, that various uh, national governments established, you know, the official agency for determining the typewriter keyboard layout. Right? Or maybe it's sort of a, a, a sort of a panel composed of industry experts who sit around a table and argue about it and decide what the standard should be and then impose that standard on everybody and force everybody to, all entrepreneurs to use that standard under penalty of law. Well, um, you know, is that kind of process likely to lead to a better solution? I mean, Obviously, if there's imperfect knowledge, the answer is no. But if we think about politicized decision-making, right? I mean, if path dependence is an issue anywhere, it's an issue for political decision-making, not market-based decision-making, right? How will this government body make its decision? Uh, you know, based on bribery and, and you know, corrupt you know, payoffs to various government officials, ego stroking, uh, you know, who has a big factory in his district as opposed to somebody else's district, who's putting more political pressure on whom, which legislator is pissed off at which other legislator over something that happened last year, and so on. I mean, if any process is subject to path dependence, it's the political process, not the market process, okay? Political actors have absolutely no incentive to get this right. Whereas market actors have every incentive to try to figure out what technology will be the best. Um, there's another point, too, about the whole concept of best. What does it mean to be the best technology, a superior technology, as opposed to an inferior technology? Um, cr- you know, the critics, the, 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 the whole, the QWERTY crowd, the people who think that QWERTY is an example of uh, market failure, they often have in mind a notion of best that's kind of from an engineer's perspective, okay? They say, well, um, uh, you know, take uh, the IBM PC versus the Macintosh. And they say, well, the Mac was really a better operating system. 
Well, I'm old enough. I remember the very first Macintosh. I had a friend when I was in college in 1984 who had the first Macintosh I ever saw. She got one of the first Macs ever. And the rest of us had IBM PCs that we used in the computer lab at school, whatever. And if you you guys remember the old DOS-based, you know, there'd be a black screen with green letters and you would type D-I-R slash space slash P and get a little, you remember that? Um, So that's what we all knew. And this, my friend had this Mac and it had a mouse. And we'd never, we'd never seen a mouse before, you know, a graphical user interface. You click and you see this really cool screen. I mean, it was neat. But it was totally a toy, okay? You actually, you couldn't really use it to do anything useful because it was incredibly slow and it was extremely expensive. Two or three times the cost of a cheap mass produced IBM PC and for doing the basic things that people did at that point, you know, typing documents. There was no web to browse in those days. You know, spreadsheets, databases. The IBM PC was actually quite a lot better in the, in the sense of better to consumers. The economic sense of superior as in more useful to people who would, you know, to consumers. Maybe not best in an engineering sense. The Mac OS was a more technologically elegant approach to computing than the old, you know, typing at the DOS prompt model. But who cares? Right? The market doesn't choose. Consumers don't choose. The market doesn't select for the most, you know, technically elegant solution. It chooses the solution that's most effective from the consumer's point of view, which leads us to the point that, you know, are there really any examples in history? Are there any real world examples where the market chose the wrong technology? Not clear that there is. Okay, look at QWERTY. So Paul David argued in a famous article that QWERTY is clearly inferior and his evidence for that was a series of studies that were done by the Navy uh, in the 1950s on typing, claiming that if you used an alternative keyboard, what's called the Dvorak keyboard, if any of you guys heard of Dvorak, it's another le- key- keyboard layout that, according to its proponents, is much more efficient. You can type faster with fewer errors if you use Dvorak rather than QWERTY. And Paul David quoted a Navy study that claimed that, you know, a Navy typist using Dvorak could type, you know, 15, 20% faster and so on, uh, and used this as, and and pointed out that Dvorak was available at at the early part of the 20th century, and yet the markets foolishly chose QWERTY, therefore the market gets things wrong. Well, uh, there was an article by two uh, economists named Stan Leibowitz and Stephen Margolis, published in 1990, in the Journal of Law and Economics, called The Fable of the Keys. Those of you who know Bernard Mandeville will recognize the pun in the title. Uh, but they actually uh, they looked at the real history of the typewriter keyboard and discovered that, in fact, Paul David's version was completely bogus, that there were lots of comparisons of different typewriter layouts. In fact, in the early days of the typewriter, early 20th century, there were hundreds of different keyboard layouts all competing against each other. And it turns out that almost all of those layouts were just as good as almost all other layouts. It really doesn't matter which one you use. Once you learn how to type, you can type pretty much just as well as any layout once you learn it. These claims that had been made in the Navy study for Dvorak, it turned out that Paul David had missed that the Navy study was written by Mr. Dvorak, (laughs) who was trying to sell more copies of his keyboard. Okay, and modern ergonomic studies show that it basically doesn't make any difference what layout you use. Um, uh, Deirdre McCloskey has also pointed out on this externality point, if it really were true that QWERTY was all that horrible, it would have paid large companies to switch to an alternative. And think for just a moment, right, the network externality story is that I, as an individual, even if I like Dvorak instead of QWERTY, I'm not going to switch because then none of my friends, I won't be able to type on any of my friends' typewriters. Okay, we'd have to, I have to get all my friends to switch at the same time and we can't coordinate that as too costly. So each user in his choice of keyboard is imposing an externality on other users who have to use that same format if they want to be compatible. But McCloskey points out that when typewriters were first introduced in the early 20th century, it wasn't, people didn't have typewriters in their homes. It was large companies that produced quantities of documents in what they called typing pools. 
right? So a big company would have a room with, you know, 50 or 100 typists in the room typing company documents. You know, if Dvorak were really 20% better, then wouldn't it be profitable for a company to require that all of its typists switch to Dvorak? And it might take a week or two to, to retrain them and so on. But once they learned it, they'd be vastly more efficient than other typists, and this company would be more profitable than other companies and so on. Yet there is no, we don't, we know of no historical example when any large company switched its typists in the typing pool from QWERTY to something else. Suggesting that even if you internalize the externality, there's no real gain. Okay, I already talked about MS DOS and uh, the Mac. Uh, when people say, "Well, Microsoft products are inefficient, wrong, bad," well, I mean, that's sort of a subjective thing, right? It depends who you ask. It depends what you're using it for. Um, likewise, with all these other examples of engines and so on. Okay, um, it's 10 o'clock, so uh, let me just add that, you know, some other issues that are interesting and which may have already been discussed this week include the whole thing about intellectual property, big debate among libertarians, and issues about open source versus proprietary software. And uh, my, my argument there would be in analyzing those kinds of issues, we are still you know, safe in relying on the economic theory that's been handed down to us and that we continue to develop, uh, you know, from, from the Austrian school. We don't need a new economics to analyze these interesting and exciting and potentially new phenomena. Thank you.